The eminent philosopher and psychologist William James, he argued that we all suffer from a form of multiple identity disorder. Let me take a case that I am somewhat familiar with, the case of one Doug Kenrick. Here's me as a teenager. During your teenage years, you're supposed to be spending your time forming a stable identity. But if you had asked me the classic identity question, who am I, when I was a teenager, I would have given you a different answer every couple of weeks. I kept sort of switching around greaser, preppy, mod, rocker. I would change my hairstyles and my attitudes and the clothing I wore to try to be accepted by whatever cool group of teenagers. I never ended up fitting in. And so here's me a few years later. <laughs> now I'm like a studied anti-conformist. If there's a social convention for the 24-year-old Doug Henrik, I would try to flaunt it. And my flair for impropriety that got me expelled from two marriages. <laughs> now here's me as a middle-aged guy. Now I'm another kind of conformist, I'm spending a, a many hours every day trying to conform to the ideal parental image of this young boy. Even inside this guy, the Doug White, we'll call him, there's still that kind of greaser teenager from Queens the anti-conformist graduate student guy. When we think about identity, our intuitive sense is that we have one identity, that the, I'm me. You know, Whether I'm at Arizona State University, which is where I work, standing in front of a class of 150 undergraduates, or whether I'm at home with this guy building a Legos Hogwarts castle, I'm the same guy. Also, there's sort of a sense that, well, our identity is more or less the teenage me that I showed you and the, the graduate student me and then the current me are all more or less the same guy. Evidence from cognitive neuroscience and evolutionary biology has kind of converged to, I think, a convincing case that the mind is modular. There's more than one you inside of your head. I would argue from the research and theory that each of us, every one of you in here, has seven distinct social selves. That's seven separate identities that pay attention to different things, that remember different things, that have very different priorities from one another. Which one is in the driver's seat at any time is a function of the social situation that you happen to be in. You don't have to take a Jekyll and Hyde potion to transform into some lascivious animal. You just need somebody attractive rubbing your thigh and you can transform into a completely different kind of a wild animal if somebody is rubbing your spouse's thigh. Now, what we do, what my colleagues and I do, have, I think, some fun methods to get people to activate different subcells and look at, well, what do people pay attention to? What do they remember? And so forth. And what we find is that activating these different subcells leads people to change completely how they want to spend their money, whether they're a conformist or an anti-conformist, whether they're creative, whether they want to punch somebody in the nose, even under some circumstances, whether they profess to believe in God. What I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on just two of these subselves today, what we could call the, the self-protective subself, the sort of inner night watchman that's on the lookout for the bad guys who might be out to get you, and the mating subself, your kind of inner swinging single, the one that responds as the right person is rubbing your thigh. Let me talk about some research that we've recently done on economic decision making. If you read the literature, like Dan Ariely's book, Predictably Irrational, or lots of these, there's a lot of popular books on behavioral economics now. Daniel Kahneman won a Nobel Prize for contributing to this body of literature at the interface of psychology and economics that suggests, contrary to the classic models of economic thinking, that human beings are often a little bit irrational and biased in their judgments. If you look in any economics textbook, you'll see a graph that looks like this now. It's from Kahneman and Tversky. And what it's showing, fairly simply, is that to an economist, $100 is $100. doesn't matter whether it's coming or going. But psychologically, the impact of losing $100 is generally stronger. If you read the behavioral economics literature, you'll see that there's, there are, in fact, all kinds of biases in the way that we make decisions about what should be an otherwise mathematical decision. Money is math, right? But there's all kinds of biases. We're not like the classical rational econs. We're what behavioral economists like to call humans. 
The problem is that if you look at humans from the perspective of behavioral economics, we're so biased and irrational as to look really more like morons. I don't think it's a necessarily a fair assessment, and I, I would argue for a third view. At some level, we're sort of deeply rational. Yes, we're biased, but we have a set of biases that would have served our ancestors' survival and reproductive success. Bring people into the laboratory, and we ask them to make judgments about various kinds of gains or losses. You gain some money, you lose some money, you gain some social status or lose some status. But before we had to make the judgments, what we did is we put them into one of two different frames of mind. In the self-protective frame of mind, we would have you imagine in your house late at night, you're all by yourself, there's no one else there, and you hear some funny noises outside, and you first try to dismiss them. That becomes clearer and clearer. It sounds like someone's trying to break into your house. And as it goes on, it sounds like there's some footsteps on the stairs. So you reach to grab the phone. The line's dead. At that moment, your door opens, and you see this shadowy figure standing there. In the mating condition, it's a different scenario. You imagine yourself, you've gone on some vacation, and you've met somebody who's very attracted to you, and you're very attracted to them. You find an excuse to spend the whole day together. You have dinner, you're looking into one another's eyes, you're totally simpatico, and it ends with this romantic kiss on a moonlit beach. Now you make these judgments about gains and losses. Well, what do you do? The control condition, incidentally, is just you imagine organizing your desk which for most normal people doesn't elicit erotic or <laughs> frightened feelings. Men are showing here in the control condition, classic loss aversion. This line here means no bias in their judgment. A loss is the same as a gain. This is what you typically expect to find. But put men in a mating frame of mind, and loss aversion goes away. In fact, it flips over. Now they're more focused on the gains than the losses. This doesn't happen for women, incidentally. Women, you can see here, become a little bit more cautious when they're in a mating frame of mind. Now, here's a replication of the same thing in my field of social psych. You're always doing, you publish a paper with three or four replications, and in this one, you get the same effect. We get it again and again, but then in this case, we added that self-protection condition, and this is just to show that it's not just generalized autonomic arousal, that men get aroused, they act differently. It's, it's only, there's very different ways that men respond to mating arousal and fear arousal. Here they're doing something that, again, makes adaptive sense. When the world is dangerous, you don't necessarily want to be paying no attention. Losses can become very important then. The argument is that this behavioral economic bias, it can ebb and flow in basically functionally adaptive ways. Also, what you're seeing here is something we often find in our research when we activate these different subselves. The mating subself tends to look at the world differently in men and women. Yeah, I guess you could say there's sort of a his and hers version of the mating subself. And quickly, to borrow a very powerful theory from evolutionary biology, this mostly applied to animals and their mating behavior, but we think it applies a lot to humans. There's this theory of differential frontal investment. If you look across a wide range of species, what you generally find is that if one sex invests more heavily in the offspring, for mammals, that's always the female. For a female, there's obligatory high parental investment. I spend a lot of time with my son. Humans, males invest a lot of time in there. But I didn't have to carry the kid inside my body you know, and then nurse it afterwards. But my wife did. So if one sex invests heavily in the offspring, then they tend to be more selective about choosing mates. Males can like eat at McDonald's or at the French Laundry. Females can only eat at the French Laundry when it comes to <laughs> this kind of an economic world. Now, as a consequence, when one sex is more selective, then the other one has to compete to say, pick me. If you go out in the field and you see animals flashing their feathers or butting their heads against one another or otherwise make a fool out of themselves, take a good guess, it'll be a male, okay? <laughs> now, here are some ways in which this shows up in some cute studies we collected a, a few years ago. This is a, a study in which we asked very simple questions. We asked people about what are your criteria in dates? There's a whole bunch of controversy about what, are men and women different? Sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're different in terms of what they want to mates. We were sort of thinking in economic terms, what about when you have to choose? You have to say, what's the lowest you'll go? And we play with this in various kinds of ways. <laughs> what is the lowest that you would go for a date? So let's take intelligence. How smart does a person have to be? What's the minimum percentile intelligence for a date? What about a sexual partner? Or what about a one-night stand? You'll never see them again. No one will ever know about it, okay? <laughs> or a steady dating partner or a marriage partner? Well, first, let's look at what women say. So women want someone who's slightly above average if they're going to go on a date with him, 
You can see here, as the involvement becomes progressively more, more involvement, the women want more intelligence. Arizona State University students want at least 65th percentile to marry, but they're willing to date a guy who's just a little above average. <laughs> what do guys want? Well, <laughs> men have similar criteria for dates. Just the, the, basically, they want an average woman before they'll date her, and, and they also have similar, exactly the same criteria for long-term mates. You're laughing because you know I've left something out here. Um, <laughs> What do men want in a sexual partner? <laughs> Actually, for a one-night stand, it goes even lower. For women, it, goes, it stays up with a one-night stand, but for, for a, it's really low. She has to be able to tie her shoelaces. Like, <laughs> maybe. I mean, the thing about this is that basically what men are saying here is that I will have sex with a woman who doesn't meet my intelligence criteria for a date. This, his and hers version of, of psychology of mating shows up in a number of different ways. And it, it actually, it shows up in, in areas totally sort of unrelated to mating, you might think, like economic decision making. And here's another one. You might remember if you took introductory psychology, a classic study by Solomon Ash. Guys come into the laboratory and they sit down and, and they're asked to make some judgments and they hear a bunch of other people make judgments. And usually the rest of the group says the right thing. But then all of a sudden, a couple of times, the other group members say, like in this case, line A, they say, is bigger than line B. And it's usually not so obvious as this, but it's sort of like you look at it, we're pretty good at judging the length of lines, and you think, oh, what do you do under these circumstances? Well, 33% of the time, the subjects went along and just said the, the thing that they knew that their eyes told them otherwise. What would you do if you were in those circumstances? Well, again, it might depend upon whether you were a male or a female and what frame of mind you're in. So we did a study in which we had people make judgments. You actually get more conformity on things that are not objectively verifiable. So we asked people to make judgments like, to what extent do you think that image there is interesting? Is this an interesting image or not? And while you are trying to decide, you see that the rest of the group has said it's very interesting, as opposed to not at all interesting. Would you go along with the group or not? Well, if you were in a self-protective frame of mind, and again, this replicates a number of times, both men and women do the same thing. When I'm feeling threatened, I go along with, you don't want to be, if there's a bunch of bad guys standing up on the hill about to you know, attack your village, you don't want to stand alone and be independent. You go along with the group under those circumstances, and men and women do it alike. What happens with a mating frame of mind? Well, women become nicer. They be, they, we found this in a number of different ways, more altruistic, more conforming to group opinion. Women just start becoming nice. But what men do is they start showing off in various ways. And one of them is they make independent judgments. What they're basically saying, we think, is like, look at me. I am a leader. I'm not a follower. We did another study like this of, of creative judgment. We did, did this in various ways. There's tests, for, a lot of them from Berkeley, about creativity. But this is one where we'd show you a painting, and we ask you, tell me a story about that. And so sometimes, like one of our subjects would told us a story about an abstract painting that looked similar to this. The setting is a seedy jazz club in which the, you know, the, the, mu the music is atonal, and the musicians have to compete with the drug dealers in the back and, the, you know, describes the smoke and this kind of cool story. And others would say things like, well, it looks like a dirty tablecloth, if feeling a little less creative. What we found is that in a mating frame of mind, men who, in the control condition, incidentally, women are more creative than the men. But in the mating frame of mind, all of a sudden, guys, this is contrary to the stereotype, incidentally, guys don't become stupider when they're in a mating frame of mind. They actually become cleverer. They say smarter things cuter things, funnier things. They're charming. You've probably all seen this happening. <laughs> We've even found that under the right circumstances, activating the mating frame of mind can get people to profess more belief in God. <laughs> I've been talking about how these different subcells become activated in different social circumstances. They also ebb and flow over the course of our lives. I mean, some of them don't really exist when you're mating subself. My seven-year-old son does not have a mating subself. Okay, There's, he doesn't spend any time thinking about Jennifer Lopez, okay, at all. It's just Legos. Okay? And my son, once we were driving through California and they were playing that song, Two Girls for Every Boy, and he, he said, yuck. I said, I'm going to watch you, son. And when he turned 13, he couldn't believe that he had ever actually said yuck to that. Thinking about these sub-selves in 
evolutionary terms, has led us to revisit Maslow's classic hierarchy that you all might have heard about in introductory psychology. Our basic argument is this, that you need the different subselves at different phases of your life. Now, I'll remind you of Maslow's ideas, and this looks kind of like Maslow's hierarchy. The first thing you need to deal with in life is these physiological needs. You come out, all you want is to be dry and well-fed, and you're not thinking about, when you're a baby, you're not thinking, I want to be accepted or respected in any way. And then, once you have your basic biological needs met, you move on to safety. You want to take a risk to get food if you're hungry, but not once you're well-fed, you start to worry about safety. Then you start to worry about affiliation. You want people to like you. Then you start to worry about status and esteem. You want to respect yourself and you want others to respect you. Now, in Maslow's hierarchy, at the top was self-actualization. If I reach the pinnacle I've gone through all the different levels and satisfied all of my needs, and I've gotten somewhat older in the course of doing this, I will become self-actualized. And the example that he liked to use was this, a musician playing their music just for themselves, or a poet writing his poetry just for himself, okay? Now, that's a lovely story, um, but we think in some ways, from an evolutionary biological perspective, we're probably not designed to go off and play the guitar just by ourselves. So we argued that at the top of the hierarchy. You needed to think about acquiring mates, then retaining those mates. The 24-year-old me didn't realize there was a difference between those two things, and they are very different. And then once you've retained mates, you have offspring often, and you take care of those offspring. And these are things that unfold this way developmentally. This quote from Oscar Wilde, we are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars would be a perfect slogan for the field of evolutionary psychology, which is the branch of social psychology I'm in. Evolutionary psychologists have spent a lot of time mucking around in the gutter, studying things like one-night stands. I've studied homicidal fantasies, all kinds of things. One of my colleagues who's at UC Riverside said, you know, Doug, normal people don't even talk about this stuff in public you know, as much less do studies on it. But at the, at the same time, evolutionary psychologists have had one eye on the stars. We've been looking for a unified theory of human nature that will help us understand where we fit into the rest of the animal kingdom. And I think thinking about ourselves in evolutionary terms can also help us understand how these different parts of ourselves fit together. Our good and bad selves our creative and our conforming selves are woven together, and we can understand them much better by thinking in this broader framework. The other thing is that if you understand ourselves in evolutionary perspective, we're all the same species, okay? And we have a common human nature that we share. So this allows us to, to understand our common identity, you know, with people in Pittsburgh, Heidelberg, and Ulaanbaatar. So thank you from all of my sub-selves to all of yours.